Wow, it's quiet, so I guess better take the opportunity to get started here. Galatians 5.1, we're going to just read one verse before we start this morning. Galatians 5.1 Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, we're going to be dealing, probably for a couple more weeks even after this, with legalism, with the context of casting it off, but we want to see where we're going. It has to really be done in a fuller context of understanding true spirituality and the Christian liberty that that brings. You can't put something off if you don't understand what to put on. You have to have both sides of the coin. So you're going to have to keep these things in the mind as we continue on, and then we'll, we'll tie some of these things together even later on in our study. But uh, we won't have it all together once we just get done with the subject of legalism. We hopefully will have uh, some greater understanding of this, but we've got a lot more work to do on the fuller context, but uh, let's commit our time to the Lord this morning. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to be in your word, and we thank you for what your word brings in our hearts and our lives, uh, directs our attention to yourself in truth, that we might know you in the way that you want us to know you, and that we might respond to you in the way that you have designed us to respond. We just pray to that end this morning that our time would be profitable. We ask you bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, we paused in our study in Galatians after having finished chapter 4 to look at legalism. And we've been at it uh, for a couple sessions. I'm not sure exactly how many sessions. The longer I stay in a subject, the, the chances are greater that it's going to be longer to get out of it because it just builds. But uh, So I won't say how many more sessions we're going to be in it. Uh, and uh, I think there's a lot of important things we haven't got to yet from an application standpoint, so we certainly don't want to miss spending time there. We're following this outline here, and we're still, of course, uh, in that third section, the development of the topic of legalism with the effects, the symptoms, and implications. Hopefully we'll be able to get into the anatomy of legalism today. I'm prepared to do that. And uh, let's see here. Last time uh, we got, uh, we started, or we've gotten quite a ways through this particular list. I'm not going to read down all of it, but we have gotten through number 11 on this 16 item list here on what legalism causes, the effects of legalism, some implications of legalism. So we've gotten down through uh, number 11 where, where we saw le how legalism leads to division. And we're going to forego any further review. Uh, if you want to get caught up on what happened on the first part of the list, you'll just have to consult the, the uh, session online if you desire. And now, I think I mentioned last night for those of you who are here, the PowerPoints, these PowerPoints are now online as well. They're accessible along with the recorded lessons so that you can get them as well. Um, okay, now we're going to move into number 12 on our list. Legalism corrupts the gospel. Turn to uh, back here in Galatians, turn back to Galatians 1. Read starting in verse 6. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what he, we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, then what you have received, let him be accursed. 
The Galatians had been delivered into the realm of grace through believing the gospel of Christ delivered by Paul. They had tasted of the liberty of a relationship with God through Christ. And then came the Judaizers as they seemed to follow or to greet Paul wherever he went. Now whether they were, these Judaizers were legalistic believers as we see a contingent of them in Acts chapter 15 among the uh, pharisaical branch of those who had believed or if they were unbelieving Jews is not completely clear but the result as we've seen was on the part of the Galatians was abandonment of grace for Judaistic legalism. Now the Galatians had been saved by faith through grace. Now they were being kept in their minds by dependence on outward performance, on law works. And we see the distortion of the understanding of God's plan and provision had backfed into the gospel message itself. The gospel itself and their understanding of it had become corrupted. Now this is what happens. How have we seen this in, let's say, contemporary terms relative to the gospel? Well, one example is lordship salvation. In order to be saved, one must submit his life to the lordship of Christ as part of the process. And this has to be somehow measured in order to determine if that's happened. And this is what's included in what is described under that realm as saving faith. In other words, you must make Christ Lord of your life if you're going to be truly saved. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not how I was saved. <laughs> uh, in fact, I know it's not how anyone is saved. For I personally have been adjusting to the Lordship of Christ voluntarily and involuntarily ever since. <laughs> uh, and I think you know what I mean. I can see it in the expressions on your face. Uh, for it is the experience of every child of God. And we won't turn there, but you just need to look at Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses 5 through 13. Every child of God is disciplined. Every child of God is disciplined. That means that there are some involuntary moments of our adjusting to the Lordship of Christ. Okay, and there are other forms of legalistic encroachment upon the gospel, some of which you may not have had contact with. Um, repent and believe as distinct steps. So the idea is you have to repent first of your sin in some form, and then you can believe or believing. Uh, believe and be baptized. Believe and do good works. And we see to reinforce people's uh, acceptance of that, some use the book of James wrongly to show that works are part of the actual salvation package. Believe and on and on and on. You know, there are other ways in which perhaps you come in contact with a corrupt gospel. And more so for the younger set, Invite Jesus into your heart. That's right. That's a corrupt gospel. All of these involve, in one way or another, something man can do or must do and something man can measure or attempt to measure. I didn't invite Jesus into my heart either. And the fact that someone else may have, may have, had nothing to do with their salvation if, in fact, they were saved. Uh, it may now be confusing them with respect to their assurance, along with anything else that would have been added to the message. The matter of the gospel is striking in its simplicity. Turn to 2 Corinthians 11. We're going to read, starting in verse 2. 
For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Now, I'm not going to get into the full interpretation of that, but the idea there is he's clearly dif differentiating the simplicity of the gospel of Christ from other versions that encumber the simplicity with other issues that are not relevant uh, to a person's salvation. We are sinners, hopelessly separated from God on the basis of our sin, unable to do or produce anything acceptable to God regarding our predicament. Uh, we, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In a fuller measure you may see that in the context of Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, where Paul is building up to the familiar verse in, in 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, 8 and 9, not of, not of ourselves, uh, but it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. According to the plan of God and completely in obedience to the Father's will, Jesus Christ came into this world to provide salvation for each man through his death on the cross. Of this work, we read in John 19.30 that Christ said, It is finished. It is finished. And we read in Romans 3.25, Hebrews 2.17, 1 John 2.2 2 and 4.10, that this work propitiated, completely satisfied the Father regarding the matter of the sins of the entire world. Now, you could have found that concept in other verses, but in these four verses, you find that concept expressed directly. Faced with this reality, the practical reality and this historical reality, what is our part? Believe. Only believe. In faith, personally accept this as true as it applies to you. Acts 16.31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. That is the simplicity of Christ. Turn back to Romans 3. We will read this passage here starting in verse 19. Romans 3.19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus." Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Faith alone in Christ alone. Anything added puts one on the wrong side of the false gospel curse pronounced by Paul in Galatians 1, 8 and 9. That's right. The seemingly innocuous addition of inviting Jesus into your heart for the purposes of helping express the decision at the level of a child puts one on the wrong side of the curse, along with anything else that can be chalked up to man's effort. 
And this is one of the consequences of legalism. Once believers start down the legalism road, it tends to permeate the life to the point of eventually contaminating the gospel. Turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. We're going to start reading in verse 5. Now when his disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? How is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now why... Is leaven a fitting illustration here? It is introduced to dough in a small dose, and it ends up completely saturating the entire lump with its effects. As noted by Paul in the Galatians 5 passage that we read earlier, these effects are desired for baking, but not for doctrine when leaven represents falsehood. In Acts 15, we see how legalism being advanced by believing Pharisees was cast out. We're not going to go there, but this was the issue of the imposing of certain Jewish requirements on Gentile believers and it created a big uproar in the church that resulted in a council meeting and the Pharisees represented their position, the believing Pharisees represented their position, in other words, that certain Jewish customs or requirements were still required. And it was, it was cast out, the council, as expressed ultimately by James, you read there, aside for, some, for certain important things which relate to other aspects of legalism that we're going to see, cast aside any requirement that the Gentiles align themselves with Jewish uh, customs or laws. So, That we took some time to look at. I think it's very important. Legalism as leaven eventually backfeeds itself into the gospel message. A person could be saved fully understanding the gospel as in the simplicity of Christ, get involved in a legalistic Christian life, and it can backfeed right back into their thinking that relates to what the gospel involves. Legalism hinders evangelism. And this happens in various ways. It affects the outward life relative to our testimony. Turn back to Matthew 5. Matthew 5, we'll read 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. There are a number of ways that the light of one's Christian testimony may be dimmed or hidden, and legalism is certainly one of them. The light of grace in Christ does not shine through our lives to the degree that our lives are characterized by legalism. Legalism does not attract one to Christ. In fact, it becomes one of the biggest um, objections to Christianity and those who observe it being practiced by believers. Secondly, a lack of burden for the lost. Turn forward now to Matthew chapter 9. Reading starting in verse 9. 
we'll read down through verse 13. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Again, with respect to the Pharisees, we're not making direct application to the believer, uh, but rather clearly in principle an improper orientation to grace diminishes one's sense of perspective, uh, understanding, relation, and concern for sinners. Rather, we, review, we view them with contempt and as people to be conveniently avoided. What's the divine viewpoint regarding people? Well, we understand people to be in the, made in the image of God, at least if you were going to look at the most basic level. And we also see them, or should see them, as one for whom Christ died. Both of those elevate an individual's value beyond what our impulses might lead us to, to guide us in our behavior toward them. So the divine viewpoint regarding people with the, within the overall context of grace understanding will ignite and promote a burden for the lost, whereas legalism will squelch it. Critical spirit. Now we've looked at this previously, last session, as a general problem relative to legalism. But let's see how this affects our posture in reaching out to others. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians 9, we're going to start in verse 19. And read down through verse 22. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under law, the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. The legalist cannot adopt an approach in evangelism that allows the flexibility necessary many times to reach certain people. This requires a grace perspective. Missionaries are all too familiar with this. If grace is going to prevail, as it must, if Christ is to be preached in truth, missionaries have to work within set cultural frameworks, which in many cases involve traditions, and behaviors that are offensive and even violate Scripture. They're unbelievers. Your objective is to work with them to the point of trusting Christ that at that point they then can receive the truth of the Word of God and make the adjustments between them and the Lord. Now you may not be aware of this, but we have a good example of this in our midst. Now, you may look at West Chapel and wonder, what's up with his hair? Uh, even to the point of a, a legalistic <clears throat> twinge. Oh. <laughs> um, but what you may not know is that there is a particular evangelistic basis for West growing his hair at this time. In the Menya culture, the relationship of cousins is regarded as closer than brothers. Uh, there, there tends to be a tension among brothers relative to family duties and an inheritance within the family that doesn't exist among cousins. Now, you've got to also bear in mind that 
in this culture, cousins live in close proximity. This isn't like in our culture where we, we don't have a close relationship with many of our cousins because they live a long ways off. So we have cousins that live as neighbors. In keeping with this, there is actually greater grief exhibited at the loss of a cousin than at the loss of a brother. Now, one way it is displayed is by allowing one's hair to grow uncut throughout the entire mourning period, which lasts as long as it is felt appropriate, but it can last, I think, at least as, as long as a year. Now, by mourning for his cousins in the way the men you do, Wes is identifying with them in a way that they both are presently aware of and will be touched by as he returns to the field. Now, it is one way of building a bridge that will help gain a standing for Wes among the many people to share the gospel. So you may want to get used to that look because <laughs> it's perhaps, as hair does, will continue to grow. You know, and that's his intention now. You know, I'm not suggesting that things might, might cha not change. We, we don't see everything ahead of us here, but that's his mindset. So the example there is in the context of Paul's uh, ad, um, admonition or his personal testimony, you adjust yourself without, as Paul says, abandoning the law of God in his mind, the, his living according to what he understands is righteous living before the Lord. He adjusts to become flexible in ways necessary to reach the people with the truth of the word of God. Okay, finally, relative to hindrances to evangelism, you have a muddled gospel, muddled Christian message, as it were. We don't need to spend any more time on this except to make the natural connection of failure in evangelism to a false gospel which cannot bring salvation. Naturally, if you have a problem with the message, you're going to have a problem with the result. And, and there are many missionary slash evangelistic efforts out there being undertaken by Christian organizations that are not resulting in the salvation of souls because the message is legalistic. In fact, you will hear this even on the field where uh, New Tribes missionaries have gone in, or I've heard it recently from Dave in Maryland, where Seventh-day Adventists, some other kind of Christian group has gone in and they live by outward conformance to uh, codes of appearance. Yet they do not know Christ. And that's a result of a message, uh, a false gospel. Next, legalism hinders ministry. As an extension of evangelism, and for similar reasons that we noted, legalism will disrupt and mute Christian ministry individually w within our own lives and then collectively as a church body. This draws on the other points we've made as well. The legalistic in individual tends to shrink back from ministry since ministry involves sinful people and could expose them to uncomfortable situations that actually will betray in them their lack of capacity in grace. It's not comfortable to be around people that don't behave in ways that make us feel comfortable. And that goes back to a lack of capacity and grace to receive people where they're at. Collectively as a church, or collectively, a church is hindered in this same way by a general spirit of legalism in how it ministers apart from grace and is also hampered by division, as we already noted. This was part of Paul's burden for the local churches that sprung up as a result of his ministry. Turn to 1 Corinthians, back to 1 Corinthians 1. We should still be in 1 Corinthians. Back to 1 Corinthians 1. Look at verse 10. And we'll read 10 and 11. 
Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. The problem more specifically here is sectarianism, if you would read the fuller context, and that is the excessive devotion to a particular individual or a sect around an individual. It is similar to denominationalism, which is more familiar to us. Sectarianism is akin to legalism in that it involves the clashing of different sets of rules and codes. So that is what Paul is, he's up against this. He'll, you know, they, a group receives the gospel, he stays with them, teaches them, moves on, both external pressures and internal uh, tendencies that we have take over and you run into these types of impacts relative to legalism, including the hindering of ministry within the body. Legalism hinders spiritual growth. Without turning there, the blueprint for spiritual growth collectively or individually and collectively is laid out in Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. I will just quote from that, verses 14 through 15, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. The legalism that would stunt spiritual growth would have been something Paul had in mind in speaking of every wind of doctrine. But let's turn again to Colossians chapter 2. We've been to this passage a couple times already. Let's go there. Colossians 2, we will read starting in verse 18. Let no one cheat you of your reward taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. Now we see clearly that growth is associated with holding fast to the head, Christ, and that this is neutralized by legalism. So legalism hinders spiritual growth. And finally on our list, which could be a, a longer list, I determined not to think of anything more on this list because I wanted to at least get to the next section because there is certainly more that you may even have thought of yourself, which is good. Uh, it is good because it, we need to be able to see and, and um, not just articulate, but be able to process this in a way that is real in our own lives. Legalism reduces Christianity to a religious drudgery. I think this could be attested to by each believer to the degree we have presently or have had a relationship with legalism. Even those who are sold out to legalism and are not struggling to cast it off would have to admit that it is void of a settled joy and peace. It can't be otherwise. It cannot result in anything other than an unsettled sense of where am I as a believer in Christ? Without returning to Romans 7, we saw this as the experience of Paul in attempting to satisfy the urge to righteousness of the new man through his efforts in the flesh. Paul was completely exasperated. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? You know, the answer he comes up with as he comes to this, thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
turn once again to Matthew chapter 11. Eleven, verse twenty-eight. We're just going to read the last three verses of chapter eleven. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The burden of grace is light because it is God who does the lifting. Our part is faith leading to rest. On the contrary, the burden of legalism is heavy leading to weariness. And I think the exhortation in Galatians 6, 9 to not grow weary in well-doing is targeted at our tendency to allow our Christian lives to default to the position of gutting it out in the flesh, which includes a legalistic frame of mind. To the contrary, God's grace is sufficient and enables us to enter into the joy, peace, hope, confidence, fulfillment, etc. of the Christian life. So that brings us through a section there on the effects, symptoms, and implications of legalism. And we will make it as far as we can in the anatomy of legalism as we start that this morning. We're going to examine in this how legalism emerges, and I'll ultimately be focusing on Christian legalism. It isn't always as blatant in its development as it appears in its end product. The beginning of the journey isn't nearly as ugly as the end of the journey. Uh, this is because it can have a seemingly biblical emphasis or basis. We're going to start by looking at Judaistic legalism as a template. Uh, there's a lot of information that we see on that. We've already seen a lot, and uh, we will draw on some additional scriptures to see this. Uh, Judaistic legalism... offers, like I said, a template for Christian legalism. Turn to Matthew 23, 23. Matthew 23, 23. I'll read verses 23 and 24. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. My focus this time in going to this passage is on the advancement of Scripture to the point that it becomes misapplied. Without needing to nail down exactly where the Pharisees were coming from in their unbelief, uh, we can draw some relevant observations from their approach to the scriptures relevant to us in terms of Christian legalism. The scriptural basis for their tithing cited here is Leviticus 27.30. Let's turn there. Leviticus 27, verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. A pretty straightforward expression of, of a standard there. But in this case, they took the letter of the law and extrapolated it out to a degree of fine application that may have been impressive to some in its precision, but that completely missed God's heart, as Christ points out. Completely missed God's heart. Turn now back to Matthew 12. We're going to go to read a, a more extended context here. Matthew 12, verses 1 through 14.
At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what it is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? That they might accuse him. Then he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the, to the man, Stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. Now this might strike a bit closer to home in that Christians still ascribe special significance to the Sabbath. But what do we find here? In their hyper-adherence to Sabbath-keeping, which I'll detail a bit more in a minute, we again see explicit condemnation in missing the mark of God's heart. How many times have we seen this? I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Christ has quoted that, I think, three times at least because we've seen three different passages in which he used that. So so it represents the heart of God versus the outward conformance to the letter of the law. They, the Pharisees, did not respond to the Sabbath command beyond its face value to get to the heart of the matter which God intended. In studying Pharisaical adherence to the Sabbath, here are some interesting points I came across, some of which you may at least have become generally aware of. I found this on uh, a Bible study on the uh, website called tidings.org. Um, we'll read this. Of all the myriad rules and regulations the Pharisees kept to preserve their ritual holiness, the Sabbath rules stood at the top. Most of their laws, the Pharisees believed that Sabbath, most holy of all their laws, the Pharisees believed that Sabbath keeping provided a righteousness non pareil without equal. People who believe in salvation by works can believe in a hierarchy of their laws. For the Pharisees, ritual holiness defined their religion, and the Sabbath, with its sedulous or diligent adherence to the minutia, defined their ritual holiness. So, simply they're summarizing the Sabbath was the apex of their system of outward conformance to the law or keeping the law um, in their practice. Now this study here goes on to echo a number of related facts that others have noted. The principle of the Sabbath predated Sinai. It was modeled by God at creation and later was commanded during the wandering in the wilderness with respect to resting on the seventh day from collecting manna. So the principle of the Sabbath predates the actual giving of the command at Mount Sinai. Therefore, it elevated its, obviously, naturally elevated its sense of priority in the mind of the Jews. Secondly, the work is stated, the stated object of the command of rest. That is not de thoroughly defined in the context of the Sabbath rest command. Turn to Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. We'll start there and go through verse 10. Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. 
But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. So the point there is it talks about work, but it's, that's a broad concept, work, right? So that presents an issue. Thirdly, though it's not clearly defined perhaps, it was to be carefully enforced under penalty of death. Turn to Exodus 31. Read verse 13 to 15. And the Lord, well, starting in 12, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people." Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. This means that God did not intend for the Sabbath command to be taken casually or lightly, which would naturally elevate one's sense of conviction regarding it and how it is to be applied. Now, there are a few references in scripture that offer explicit guidance as to what work constituted. So let's look at those. Let's go to Exodus 35. Read verse, just verse 3. You shall kindle no fire throughout your dwellings on the Sabbath day. So we have a prohibition against kindling fire. Now, now, this may have been a standalone command. It had no bearing on the idea of work. But uh, the rabbis have included this as an item of work. This could be a totally separate thing, not related. It could be, okay, here's another category, you shall not kindle fire. But that's explicit. Go to Jeremiah chapter 17. We'll read verses 21 and 22. Jeremiah 17, 21. Thus says the Lord, Take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring in it in by the gates of Jerusalem, nor carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, nor do any work, but hallow the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. So we see here a little bit more of a development. You see a prohibition against bearing burdens, which is itself a term requiring additional explanation. In Nehemiah 13, 15 through 21, we see Nehemiah enforcing this particular command with more specificity. But this seems more so an example of failure of the people to apply, in, in Nehemiah that is, to apply the principle of the Sabbath where it should have been obviously understood to be applicable, meaning an orientation in, in worship of the Lord. So as Nehemiah applies it, it doesn't add really that much more to what, what we see here in Jeremiah. Some rabbis derived specific prohibitions against collecting wood and preparing food from Exodus 16, the account where the Jews were prohibited from these activities as they wandered in the wilderness, and God provided them a double portion of manna on the sixth day for their resting on the seventh day. So the rabbis have derived from that food preparation and collecting of wood that, that you see in the context as well. It would seem that the details of obedience would have worked themselves out naturally if the people simply regarded the Lord as he wanted to be regarded on the Sabbath in the realm of cessation of economic activity. Charles Clough was here and spoke uh, of the Ten Commandments, and that is the sense in which he presented it. It's economic activity, uh, money-making activity, as it were, uh, that is being spoken of here, 
we see that carried over in our own society. We do not work on Sunday, or at least just as a general rule. But to those who are fixated on outward performance, the notion of work must be precisely defined if it's going to be able to be measured for compliance. Uh, so the Jewish religious leaders from the days of an antiquity impart, embarked upon an exercise in developing such a code to be observed. I'm going to have to end with this, and I've got more to work to do with work uh, next time before we move out of this particular section. Uh, but I want we can we can go to this quote here again from the same study. With all this grist for the, their legalistic mill, the rabbis of old elevated Sabbath keeping into the holy, holiest of all laws. Of course, this level of piety required precise definitions galore, and they went at it with an enthusiasm that has not abated in thousands of years. A quotation from Adin Steinsaltz, the essential Talmud, gives the flavor of the orthodox position on the Sabbath. In the most general sense, the numerous Sabbath laws are an expanding network of minute details deriving from several basic concepts, which eventually create an almost Gothic structure made up of thousands upon thousands of tiny and meticulously fashioned details clustered around an original form. And I would say this original form itself was never to be followed, as they're speaking of this original form, uh, apart from an inward fear of the Lord. So it is only natural that once one embarks upon outward conformance that the rules that, in doing that, it's natural that the rules only expand once your posture is outward conformance. We couldn't begin to delve into the thousands upon thousands of them cited here, but we can examine the basic concepts which are 39, and I'll just throw that up as we <laughs> wrap up here. Um, these, we will start with this next time, but these are 39 general categories from which the thousands of additional fine points are derived by the rabbis over all the many years. And as you can imagine, as technology has advanced, boy, they have to have a category for texting and using cell phones. And I mean, it just never ends, does it? Uh, if, if it's going to meet the structure that they have. So I do want to share with you uh, this website here. I took this right off an Orthodox Jewish website. Teshuvah means return, repent. And this is the stated goal of the director of this website. Although we support everyone's right to believe as they would like, this site is dedicated to, de to defeating the attempts of missionaries of all types to deceive Jews into converting to another religion. And they, he goes on specifically to cite Christianity as one of the most notorious. Uh, as you can imagine, grace is going to be one of the biggest oppositions to legalism of this sort. But he's devoted to ensuring that Jews follow the law. And this is just an example. We, I, don't, I see a few things that would give us trouble there. Combing, that's a problem for us if we're going to show up on Sunday. Um, uh, the fact that we drove here is a problem, by the way. Um, but anyway, uh, we'll leave it there and we'll get back to this and pick up here. And we will move in out of the use of this as a template for Christian legalism into how uh, the manifestation of this spirit in Christianity as well. well let's um, look to the Lord as we close here. Father, we do thank you for the liberty that we enjoy through Christ, not for its own sake, but because you have freed us to enjoy you and to worship you and to see your wonder and your plan and purpose in Christ that exceeds anything that anyone could ever imagine and gives us the great opportunity for an eternal uh, relationship with you and all that that will bring. And we just pray in measure we might come to grips with it more and more in this in time that we might enjoy that in our relationship with you personally but also be able to express that and shine as it were in lights in this dark world and share that with others in Jesus name we pray amen